Right, so I think we're live. So, uh, yeah, good evening, everyone. And um, my name's Dan, and I am here on the Fergan with Rob Miller of Tau Cross and Amoebix fame um, and various infamy. <laughs> so, um, hello, Rob, how are you doing? Hi, Dan. Very well, thanks. Uh, nice to be on here. Uh, I was, I've, um, I've watched a couple of your programmes now, and I was, uh, I was well impressed with that, so... Yeah, I'm quite uh, quite happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. Oh, you're very welcome. So, um, the reason that I wanted to get uh, Rob on is that um, those of you who are not familiar with Rob, uh, he's a musician and has been for, um, you've been an active musician for, what, three or four decades now, Rob? When did you start well, making yeah. music? I, I actually had a friend round the other night and we dug out the old ye olde Amoebix band with no name scrapbook, you know, and all this stuff. It's just like now it's 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 like uh, it's all yellowing away. These old pages, it looks like a, a medieval grimoire. But me and my brother really started a band in 1979. So, yeah, it's been a while. It's been a bit yeah. of time now. OK, so yeah. Yeah, we're looking at 42 years. Yeah. yeah, but with a big break in between. So, yeah. you know, I was in in recovery from, from being in a band for quite a while. <laughs> and uh, now you're fervently back at it mm -hmm. and have been for a yeah, while. Yeah. yeah, I have been, yeah, since, um, since 2009. No, actually 2008, I suppose, really, when I got involved with the, um, the Wallace Project, which was basically um, uh, the, the sort of retrospective or look at, the, the British punk scene um, in the 1980s and his kind of like video contributions towards stuff. Okay. Uh, and he, he further kind of prompted us to revisit a lot of the old Amoebix thing. Again, like bringing out the photographs and talking about a band that had hitherto had, it would have become a sort of a bit of a cult and a legendary band because there's so little material available on uh, who we were, what we were about, what the whole story was and that. So he wanted to be able to, um, condense that into uh, a DVD package, which was great fun to do. But along with that came this uh, kind of the opportunity to be able to go back and have a look at the, the music again. And of course, getting Roy Mioga on board and all that kind of stuff. And so it stirred up a whole hornet's nest of trouble. And in one sense, putting Amoebix back together was... Yeah, it was almost like angering the gods, really, because we went through so many difficulties and able to to be able to do what we wanted to do, and to put out an album. There was a lot of a lot of very difficult stuff that went on alongside with that. But um, of course, Amoebix ended up in the usual catastrophe that it did the first time, and and that, that kind of repeated itself. And then I was left um, on my backside, wondering what to do uh, musically with the rest of this stuff that had suddenly bubbled up to the surface after after twenty odd years of gestation um and being reinvigorated really by the whole experience of playing in a band again so that's how tau cross came about and of course that was the story of both uh my 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 heady spiral to the heights and uh my ingracious fall as well which um you know i think most people know all about that too <laughs> um just, just before i go on um rob's um video connection isn't great so um we're going to stick with it for a bit but you're you're, you're seeing a still of him, and it's not really meant to be a still. Um, if we keep having uh, issues, we'll just turn the video off. But um, his, uh, his, he's in a quite remote place, Rob. Um, so if his uh, connection decides to pick up, then hopefully we'll, uh, we'll see some, some nice jittering movement from him in a minute. But um, for now, it's fine. But um, what, what, what's... Um, Still got 56k. What's that, Rob? So we've still got 56k modems here, I think. <laughs> yeah, the good old days, yeah, when you couldn't make a call and use the internet at the same time. Yeah, I'm old enough to remember those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> Sorry, Dan. Yeah, we'll, we'll turn this, we'll turn the, um, the the video off if it becomes uh, just a problem there. Yeah, let's just, just see, let, let's give it a bit more time and we'll see if it, it if it picks back up, but uh, if not then we'll just uh, we'll have a nice uh, image of yourself and your voice. Yeah. Um when Oh, we've had a bit of movement there. Yay! Someone's listening. <laughs> it lives. Hey, um, when when you did, when the um, the the kind of resurgent Amoebix album um, Solar Mass came out, what what can you remind me what label that came out on? 
Oh God! Well, it, it, that's a story in itself, isn't it? Because it was supposed to come out on um, on Alternative Tentacles, yeah. Um, and then we had a fallout with them because basically they started treating us like sixteen-year-old kids when we were fully grown adults. It's like, yeah. oh, actually, no, we we run our own show these <clears> days. And then, then it went on to a profane existence. And uh, Dan there had a had a huge Wendy hissy fit um, over over little little bits and pieces that annoyed him. So. Uh, we severed our ties with him, and then I ended up going back to an old friend from the uh, the days back in Devon when we started. He ran the, the local record shop in Tavistock and went on to form his own record label called Easy Action, which is based down in uh, good old Cornwall, which is like my part of the world. And um, he puts out stuff. He puts out uh, old Bowie, T-Rex, um, uh stooges all that kind of stuff you know uh, a, lot, a lot of sort of like unknown or kind of rare recordings of things but so it was quite quite a weird thing for him to to take on board a, a band like amoebix but he rose to the challenge and it, it i suppose it restricted a great deal the audience that we could have had because you know we didn't have a big company behind us we didn't have a massive budget for doing anything at all any any kind of um publicizing and stuff but Good music sells on on the on the back of being good music. So mm. things like that, things like Sonic Mass, are, are pretty much a slow burner, which um, they gradually circulated around and really uh, really started to either um, inspire a lot of people or other people, of course, traditionalists did not like it at all because we were bringing a, a kind of different approach to the whole. Uh, the whole Amoebix thing as such. It's the same kind of spirit, but I suppose with a modern production and different songwriting, um, whereas people people like the, to fetishise bands to a certain degree, and they'd like you to stay back in a, in, a, in a recording studio in Bristol in the 1980s and never really able to be, be moving out of that box. But I suppose that goes for a lot of expectations about bands and about people generally, um, what's what's expected of you, and, and the, the stark reality of... You having a life of your own, and you trying to um, to being engaging as an individual uh, and to mature as an artist as well. He said somewhat pretentiously. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mention it because um, I was working at the time that that album came out. I was working for um, Plastic Head Music Distribution, and yeah. um, uh, we. I couldn't remember whether we. Uh, we handled the production for that album or just the merchandise contract. I think Plastic had that had the merch contract for, for you guys at that point. Um, so I was actually involved in designing some a couple of T-shirts for you that were sold and, and released through Plastic Head at the time. Mm-hmm. So uh, it, it was a it was an inter- interesting time because um, yeah I mean I found that a, that that album uh, was a real grower on me. I, uh, it got played a lot in the office at the time and. Um, it's over the years I've come to appreciate more and more each time I hear it. It's one of those, those albums. So uh, I don't know how many of those who are, are watching out there are, are familiar or, or fans of Amoebix. I'm sure there's, there's a good number of you, but those of you who aren't, Amoebix um, are a, a highly uh, respected um, or were a highly respected um, English uh, you know, punk metal. I mean, you get called cross punk, but I mean, to my ears, it's just kind of a, a hybrid of punk and metal. Um, with a lot of interesting lyrical subject matter. Um, I mean, do you do you look fondly uh, upon the whole time with Amoebix? Well, yes and no. Uh, it's always, you know, it's always nice to look back and, and to romanticise the the whole experience. But when you're when you're in the middle of a situation, it's not always that good. But mm. we have this kind of human ability to be able to scoop up memories favourably and uh, and make a nice picture out of them. So, generally speaking. Of course, it was a great, great, great time in my life. And when you're young, when you're when you're 16 or 18 years old, and you've got that kind of enthusiasm for something that you really want to do, and that, that you feel the um, the real push um, the, of 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 having to manifest this thing, this thing that you you feel inside yourself, then you just make it happen. And the circumstances around us, you know, squatting in Bristol and having no money and and just basically living a, a pretty rubbishy sort of life at the time, those things didn't get in the way in in, in the way that you'd expect them to so much. You know, we we would find a way to practice, or we would, uh, you know, we would we'd find a way to, to write songs, and we would just club together money and get in a van and go and play gigs here, there, and the rest of it, kind of doing free festivals on the one hand, or little tours around around the UK, uh, probably as far north as 
as uh, the the station in uh, in Newcastle or in South Shields at that time. Actually, a lot, yeah, a lot, a lot of gigs in Newcastle. But yeah, it was a, it was a great time, um, and it was also frustrating as well, I suppose, because myself and my brother Stig, we we kind of, I suppose, we expected that we were projecting more than we actually were at the time, um, and we didn't seem to be getting so so much attention back that we we thought that we needed in order in order to be able to grow and to be able to make the band into what it should have been so we 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 um abandoned ship in in 87 and it was just it was almost like six months before john peel um suddenly turned around and he started championing things like um napalm death and heresy and stuff like that so right, you had yeah. all these bands that we've been playing with in that in that scene that we've that been playing alongside all of a sudden them them being pushed into the limelight and amoebics being like this relic that was never never remembered at all until really i suppose the 90s mm. when people were, would be digging back through and saying oh who, who was around at that time and of course you know we would we were doing what we did and we really believed very strongly in that too but the belief wasn't quite enough yeah i mean i, I can i can sympathize with that i mean even though i've not had um um i've not been in a band that's been as as influential over the decades as Amoebics, um, you do hit a point when you're a musician where you've given it your all and you need a kind of um, uh, some kind of third party from somewhere to to give something back in order for you to continue. Um, especially if you're um, at a point where you're aspiring to um, make it any kind of um, meaningful, practical part of your existence. You know, if you're going to kind of put off getting that day job or moving on to another career or some other pursuit you need that kind of just that extra nudge just over the edge um so i can i can sympathize yeah. with that feeling but i know that in in the years since amoebic split up um your your kind of fame and and um renown has grown and uh, presumably that's what led to um the the uh the 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 comeback album and then tau cross yeah yeah there was, it was really that it was realizing there was a demand for it because i disappeared up up to a remote scottish island it was well it was remote back then it's not so much anymore mm. um and i lived for quite a while this is obviously before the internet so back then you just get letters um if anything at all and i didn't have much if any contact with the scene or people within that back in the in the old world there so i had no idea what had gone on mm. and it wasn't really until the internet became a publicly accessible medium i suppose it was about 80 so about 96 97 here on sky when a friend showed me how to use the internet and uh, <laughs> i thought well i'll just type in amoebics and it's like oh oh well really okay there's like hundreds of thousands of things going on there it's like well that's interesting so it wasn't it didn't completely go under the waves and um, it seemed to have uh, just bubbled away um, and provided a lot of uh, a lot of important inspiration for a lot of diverse bands actually yeah um, not just yeah. within the sort of punk medium um, or just within the metal world but pe people from all over and of course most notably you had people like sepultura who at some point back in the the 90s were i think they were brazil's second largest export next to coffee or something ridiculous like that you know <laughs> so it's something to be said for that really it's like yeah. and their their album arise and there's my friend started playing me some of this um sepultura band that i'd not heard i just remembered seeing adverts back in the early fanzines and stuff the old black metal fanzine and all the rest of it but uh, i'm just thinking oh that's amoebics uh, and that's amoebics and so's that you know it's just sounded a lot like what we were doing but played by professional people who are a lot tighter and a lot more competent yeah i mean i, I come from i come from a, a black metal background musically as you know rob and um i mean when i listen to celtic frost um I, you know, it's it's funny because um, people often say that Dark Throne, you know, the dark, the the black metal band Dark Throne, have ripped up a uh, ripped off a lot of Celtic Frost. But when I listen to Celtic Frost, I can hear. I mean, I know that Celtic Frost were around in the eighties, about the same time as you guys. But um, you, you were just ahead of them, and I can hear a lot of Amoebics in in Celtic Frost, and certainly in Dark Throne. It's funny that because I um I met Tom uh, Warrior 
for the first and, and only time down in Roadburn in 2019. Right, and he was coming out of his um, his hotel room. And, and I went up and introduced myself. I said, you don't know me. My name's Rob. I used to play with a band called Amoebics. It's like just, there was no registry, this registering there at all. So I was like, oh, okay, well, we're, yeah, we're not going to have that conversation because oh, clearly he, he he didn't seem to know Amoebics anyway. So hmm. but he, maybe, maybe you heard of it, but maybe it was by something else. So I don't know. I think that perhaps there was, there was a kind of zeitgeist around yeah. at that time that a lot of people were really kind of um, really exploring the parameters whereby they were making dirty music, really, which was moving away from mainstream metal, and as a consequence, had to had to blend to, um, with the the unprofessionalism of of punk. Uh, with I suppose the the ultimate of that would be would be Venom at the time because that that was you know they they could have passed as a punk band apart from the, the lyrical content of, of most of the stuff at, at one point anyway. Hmm. So you, I mean, you had the, with, with Amoebics, you had a real genuine DIY attitude, which is, which is something that you're known for um, among the, the legions of, of people that still worship Amoebics. Um, certainly those that, that still do after the, the debacle a couple of years ago anyway. Um, but it's, what inter- you know, and this, and this is one of the, the reasons that I wanted to get Rob on to talk is because um, I'll just talk a little bit about how um, Rob and I um, be- uh, became friends um, recently, which is that a couple of years ago, um, Rob was about to release a new Tower Cross record. Um, was was it going to be still going to be called Messengers Messengers of Deception at that time, Rob? Yes, yeah, yeah. Same, same album title. Same title. Mostly the same title, yeah. apart from a couple. So I don't know who it was that discovered it, but someone, I think, was it someone at Relapse who discovered that in your thanks list you'd you'd thanked um, a man called uh, Gerard Menuhin? No, it was actually, it was a German fanzine called Ox fanzine in Germany, but it's it, it was... It was kind of likely for for Germany because he was more of a known quantity over there right. than he would have be, been by anybody else. So they picked up on that one um, and they 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 had a complete flap, freaked out and got in touch with. Uh, actually, they, they were pretty sneaky because they knew that they were going to be pulling the pulling the rug out from this one. But at the same time, they did an interview with me, mm. and so they so they wanted to go into this sort of territory. Uh, and have something to be able to present later on. So they sort of almost did like a sun expose. It's like, and Rob Miller gave us this interview just before he was thrown off his label. And you can see how bad a person he is just by reading through this. So yeah, yeah, Ox fanzine um, okay. gave the heads up to to relapse and told them that they should be very concerned about this. Right. And yeah. That, uh, I'd, 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 I wasn't familiar with uh, Gerard, and I've still I've still not read his book, um, but. Um, uh, what is it? What, what's the book called? Uh, tell, tell the truth and shame the devil. Tell, tell the truth and shame the devil. Yeah. And the, I would say um, it's not it's, it's not it's not a well written book. It's it's really sort of really jumbled, really messy. Mm. Um, one of the reasons that I I put that up there in the first place was because it presented me with some extraordinary information. Uh, and not just on the uh, on the, uh, the 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 Second World War period, but the the First World War and the things leading up to that, and a lot of mm. lot of other events which were unrelated mm. to the assumed subject matter. Um, so it it was it was very inspirational in the, and I thought you know it's a naivety of me really. It's I'm thinking I'm really excited by this because there's things here that I think everybody should be talking about and I just need to share that. And of course you go, Oh shit. Oh no. People actually don't want to be talking about this, any of this kind of stuff at all. So I'm thinking I'm doing everyone the world a favor and, uh, immediately have the, have the lid, um, slam down on my fingers. Uh, and, uh, as you know, the consequences of that were pretty much losing lo- losing the band, losing the losing the label, uh, having the 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 cat- back catalogue destroyed, um, and and being um, vilified uh, publicly across the internet uh, by some individuals that I never met, met in my life, and other people that I met, met once or twice, but thought that they were somehow friends. You know? I don't know. It's it's like you're taking the words right out of my mouth. And th- this is ultimately the reason why when this uh, controversy erupted around this, um, I contacted Rob. Um, I had a, um, a an email address from a, a mutual friend of ours. And uh, I sent Rob an email just because I... I knew that someone in his position um, at that point who's being um, kind of um, piled upon by 
you know the media and all of the kind of hangers on and the the twitter the twitter arty type people and and all of this um y- you need you need to feel like you're not alone in that kind of situation um so i wanted to i felt compelled to send rob an email um not specifically because i wanted to um support anything specific that he had been accused of or um as i say i wasn't even familiar with uh, gerard menuhin um whose book is quite controversial because it even though he is um i believe partly jewish himself it questions questions a certain um event in history which um is forbidden to question um but i i felt like rob could do with knowing that there are people out there that you know, who who still believe in freedom of, of exploration and, and thought and things. And like you say, Rob, you know, when you when you discover information like this, I'm very much the same. You know, when I discover information about, um, you know, the, 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 the crimes of central banking over the millennia um, or, or, well, yeah, probably millennia. Um, or when I discover, you know, I mean, what's happening now with the with the scandemic and things like this, all of these grand lies um, that. And when you find something that that um, shines a spotlight on these mistruths, you get ex- people like us get excited about that. So I can completely understand how you felt and why you, you know, perhaps um, innocently felt that other people would be um, kind of supportive of, of your desire to to kind of uncover uncover truth. Um, so that's that's what happened. I sent Rob an email, um, had a had a nice reply from Rob, and. Um, um, you know, just 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 kind of some some friendly back and forth there. Um, when the re-recorded version of Messengers of Deception came out, um, which came out late last year, didn't it, Rob? That- uh, yeah, yeah. It, it actually, yeah. I think in in December actually, December fourth. Okay, yeah. yeah. And I just I, I only discovered it um, a few weeks ago, um, and I got back in touch with Rob and. Um, I was blown away by the album. Absolutely loved it. And anyone, anyone here who's into um, into metal or or indeed punk or or heavy rock or whatever, I'd I'd uh, suggest checking the album out. It's a really great album. Um, and the lyrical subject matter it touches upon um, lots of things that Rob's passionate about. And some of those things I hope we we can go into um, in this chat if we've got time. Um, so um, yeah, we 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 uh, we got in touch and we've been exchanging emails back and forth, and um, you know I hope that um, we you know, I'm, I certainly feel like there's a lot that I could learn from Rob, um, you, you know, because it, I'm drawn to anyone who has has that kind of open-minded hunger to to learn new things and to uncover truths and to um, to to understand more about how the world really works um, f- from their own research as opposed to having it spoon fed to them. Um, and Rob is certainly someone who takes that approach to life. Um, so, well, I, to be honest, Dan, I mean the thing the thing about this um, was that it could have gone two ways, uh, and I became aware pretty early on that. Um, the the idea with this kind of cancel culture that that was back then it seemed to it's only two years ago now not even that but back then it seemed to be quite a novel thing you could see it from time to time now it's absolutely it's invasive it's absolutely everywhere now um so it it does it begins it begins to consume itself but what was quite apparent with this is that there's an expectation from you as the person who's um who's committed the the the, the heresy um to to get down on your knees and beg forgiveness mm-hmm. from the mob and, and the mob themselves um it's not going to actually stop them what they'll do is they keep on kicking while you're down yeah. and they're they will effectively never ever let you back up again mm-hmm. now part of the decision that i made personally w- was to not allow that to happen and to never apologize for something which um I didn't see was a problem whatsoever. No. Uh, just saying, I, I read a book. I like information. I I, I feel that um, that good information should be shared. Uh, if it's not good, you can question it. But you need an open forum always to be able to discuss things, however controversial they, you, you you find them to be. But one of the things that made me more adamant than anything else was the the discovery and the realization that the discussion of certain topics or from a particular period 
uh, of history is punishable by um, by jail sentences in Germany and in France. Mm -hmm. And that there was a, a, a woman called um, Ursula Heverbeck, 94 years old, who was put into prison for four years for things she said. And for yeah. me, that was almost like uh, that's that was the straw that broke the camel's back. And I thought, if I back back down before the, these people now, they're going to keep doing this kind of thing to vulnerable people. They're going to be reaffirmed in their bully tactics, yeah. and they're going to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And um, so you ha you're going. It comes down to you. This is your moment. And it's like, yeah. do you fold? Or do you stand? Yeah. Now I'm not trying to transfer any kind of nobility to to what I did because I don't actually consider that there was any choice whatsoever. It's like as a human being, you say this is not acceptable. I'm not having it, and I don't care about any of this stuff. So if it means you, you lose uh, the the best part of your friends uh, and you lose all the uh, all the um, <laughs> the potential that you had as an artist, because at one point it was like, well, that's me done. Um, I'm not going to be able to, to do anything ever again kind of stuff, but that was okay. And you make that decision and say, well, I will willingly go into this place and step through that because if I don't do that, what's the point in living? Why, why, do, why live as a coward? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, why is yeah. a scuttle under a rock and why play, why play a game by somebody else's rules yeah, when they want to take terms about how you should behave, how you should think, how you should act and essentially become a modern day thought police yeah it's it's almost like a, a type of vampirism is you know as you say if you were to to get down on your knees and and you know virtually grovel on social media um they're just going to keep preying upon you they're gonna they're gonna keep sucking away um and because some of these people and i, I know this from my own experiences which are similar though perhaps less less extreme than yours um there are there are a, a clique of people out there who really get off on this kind of drama. You know, anyone out there listening who's not familiar with um, with the the metal the, with the music scene and how tightly it's policed by um, these kind of the, the these kind of neoliberal um, thought police who really aren't very liberal at all. Um, it's quite extraordinary, um, and I've I've experienced it because I um, spent a few years doing work for uh, design work for Varg Vikernes from Burzum, and just that ha has been enough to get me uh, so-called cancelled in the eyes of of a small number of people. Thankfully, just a small number, and I think that's probably the case with Rob. They're, they're always a very vocal minority. These people, and. Uh, I would I would actually be quite surprised if the the record sales of messengers of, of messengers of deception has been significantly less than previous Tower Cross records. I think most people who buy records and really love music for what it is um, don't care about any of that nonsense. It's just a very small vocal minority. What do you think? Mm, trying to dictate terms. Well, this uh, it's interesting because uh, the 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 press and drummer with Tower Cross sent me. Uh, uh, a video the other day that, that he he dug up out of his collection and basically filmed it on his phone. And of course, it's the whole Ayn Rand on thing with with Rush. And I don't know whether you know about that at all, but it was like looking into a mirror because I didn't realise that the it was a it was the same situation, but with a very very famous band, um, but thirty years ago where Rush were releasing the album Twenty One Twelve, which I suppose was their greatest work ever. And uh, they went and wrote in the liner notes um, their thanks to uh, Ayn Rand, who was perceived as being, I, I guess, uh, basically right wing, um, maybe libertarian, and um, an author. And that outraged um, a lot of their a lot of their fan base, and they went through the whole mill. But of course, the the difference was that Rush was such a um, uh, such a, a valuable asset to the record companies that they they weren't able to actually cut off their nose to spite their face in that case. Whereas mm. uh, Tau Cross were in in a in a stable of maybe fifty bands or uh, at term um, prolapse records. I mean relapse <laughs> records. Um, so so it was quite affordable for them to be able to um, just, just throw us out of the nest as such, you know, and 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 subsequently um, see themselves as the self-appointed moral guardians of the metal scene, who are who are, are stopping the, the the poor feeble minds of the uh, of the um, influ the easily influenced individuals from from being um, from being uh, desecrated by by this awfulness, whatever it was. Nobody nobody knows what it is yet, except for me. But um, everyone's of course of course they've extrapolated. A whole world of ideas from 
me mentioning one name on, a, on an album cover and uh, yeah. they've kind of invented a parallel universe where i am this or i am that whatever but you know you know tuck tuck in you know fill your fill your boots lads whatever you know yeah make it up as you go along well uh, I, i'm doing my thing i um i and, and this is partly being inspired by people like rob um i made a statement from the walkensman which is walkensman is my musical project i made a statement from my walkensman facebook page um because uh, I felt that particularly with, with everything that's going on at the moment globally, um, I just felt this this kind of um, this absolutely uncontrollable urge to just you know state my you know where my where my flag on my sleeve so to speak and and just to let the world know where I stand um, fearlessly and it's you know it's it's very inspiring when people such as as yourself Rob who who um, don't bow and apologize to these kind of th this mob um which is absolutely the right thing to do um and it it feels good not to care about what they think it really does um i'm i don't know if you share that view but it, it's it, you know it's just i mean to me it's it's funny to think that there are people who um think that i who really think that it, it matters to me whether they think that i'm uh, cancelled or not you know i mean i like, like i try to mention to these people you know musicians of of my size don't we don't make a living from the music we make we we do it for for the love of it um it doesn't matter if these few people who probably would never buy a record anyway you know they would probably just listen for free on spotify um it really doesn't matter to 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 us whether this tiny vocal minority um have an issue with our kind of free uh, fr freedom of, of thought and expression. Yeah, well, it's it's um, yeah, it's a funny thing, isn't it? Because it's it's an age now whereby the people that haven't really earned any of their own stripes are are empowered by the internet. Yeah. Um, so they've they've discovered that what you can do is you can you can try and um. Uh, you try and f form a sort of frothy mouth consensus amongst um, fellow lunatics and attention seekers uh, if you just get on the back of, of something and ride it for all it's worth. And like you said, in this sort of vampiric, um, uh, 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 frenzied energy of trying to get everything you possibly can, every every morsel out of this particular thing before you move on two weeks later onto the next victim. And that's how it goes. It's people that live vicariously through what they see as being the suffering of others. But the great thing about this, of course, at the, at the, at the first instance, it was very difficult here because it was just the two of us. That's myself and my wife and uh, and our world was actually <laughs> collapsing around us but you get to a stage where you um you've made your decision and you walk you walk that walk and you go through and then looking back now it was the best decision that i could have ever ever have made mm -hmm. um because it gives you a final kind of liberation from an enslavement that you didn't even realize that you were in it's not just that of a of a a, a very very compromised music scene but it's that of a whole industry which is um which is predicated on the idea about um conformity to a particular a very narrow and particular sort of um political uh, idealism if you like so talking with a friend of mine from london the other day and and, and just pointing out that the, the music and the music industry is all is it's left wing it's entirely left wing and not to say that one is one thing's better than the other but there's no there's no equal representation and if there is it always seems to be really extreme you know you'll get the screwdrivers and all that kind of stuff and it's just like that looks ridiculous it, and it doesn't sound much better than that either but you know you need to have a you need to have a balanced conversation between people um of different 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 points of view because all of this thing kind of goes around in a horseshoe anyway. Mm. Where it comes to political spectrum, it doesn't doesn't diverge left and right from a middle. It, it goes around a big loop and it starts to join at, at the point where people get more and more extreme about their their particular points of view and the way that they're going to manifest those in the everyday world. But whereas most people, I hope, hopefully, you know, like like ourselves, all that we want to do is explore the world and explore our, our own minds and our position within this universe and understand a little bit more about it. And it's exciting to, to peek behind the veil of things that have been purposely either, um, either obscured, hidden or occulted 
uh, by individuals or, or groups of individuals in order to be able to maintain pa power structures or main con maintain control over the individual or, or over the, the society as a whole. So I've always seen myself as being a, a pioneer, both in the so in the in the in the, the occult sense, but also in the socio-political sense too. It not not in a not in a not in a broad self-important way, but uh, that's my own that's my mo for myself. That's how I how I perceive my journey down here. It's like I've got to keep on peeling back these layers. I've got to keep on understanding and reinterpreting because there will be new bits of information which um, which kind of challenge the things that i believe at this point in my life and i'm going to have to process those and go okay right well i need to reorientate and it's almost like being you know being uh, in, a, in a ship at sea and having to to trim your sails to be able to get in the right direction you need you you can't stick with one point of view no. and you can't stick with one one rigid sort of uh so-called moral outlook for the whole of your life you need to be flexible yeah and we come back to the, the old blackness terms which is start just sorry just before and um, the, the the blacksmith thing about um uh, uh tempering you know about about um they say so that the the phrase to lose your temper that comes from the, the line of work that i'm in and it implies that without without the correct treatment of heat um the the blade itself is useless and the same without without the, the correct uh treatment of uh, balance within the individual the individual is, is useless they will break or they will bend one or the other yeah sorry go on down i should no it's all right I, sh I should mention to to those of you that don't know that rob is um is a blacksmith um and uh um among other things makes swords for a living so um that's that's pretty unusual um pretty special and yeah i imagine it's it's interesting hearing that kind of um analogy that you make there between the you know the the kind of the subject of the blacksmithing the sword or whatever and the person and you know you can read kind of philosophers going back into time immemorial and there are so many kind of, of these kind of philosophical comparisons between um swords and man and and you know it's i'm sure you know a lot more about that than i do but there's a lot of wisdom in that mm. well when i when i first got into this sort of line of work i was um simultaneously kind of dipping into arthurian mythology and stuff like that and and a lot of north norse mythology and um, some of the, the some of these kind of like uh, mythical cycles that we're used to here in, in in the west and you'd always have this recurring motif of the sword in one guise or another you know so it was fascinating for me, but also I was reading Jung at the time too. So I was beginning to understand the idea about numinous symbols and how they they um, they have they have um, an independent life within the, the psyche of the individual, hmm. and these things that keep on recurring from time to time. And one of the ones that's still very very much alive, and you know I know it through my experiences day to day because there's so many people are fanatical about swords. It's because it's there. It's always there. You know, every every generation seems to have some kind of um, sword and sorcery epic, which is the background of the of their youth. Where you know you had Lord of the Rings, and bef before that you had uh, Highlander, you had Conan the Barbarian, and all this kind of stuff, which informs people at an early age, but also gives them that idea about the sword as this a symbol of consciousness but also as a symbol of directed will too so without going too far off the track that was kind of my my interpretation of things too yeah it's and it's funny as a lyricist um with the the lyrics that i've written throughout the various bands i've been in um and you know namely walkensman i i always need my lyrics to feel timeless um and so to that end i could never write about guns or or, uh, or or any anything like that, but I could write about swords, and it's and it's interesting to think because guns aren't that modern anymore. You know, the guns have been around for a long time, so really they've kind of you'd think that they've kind of earned their timeless status, but in the kind of myth mythological mind. It, it, to my mythological mind, certainly they they haven't um, attained th that same timeless status as as swords. So th there's something. There's something symbolic in swords which feels a lot more universal than any other kind of weapon or or even most other symbols in general. Um, and it's probably for that very reason that you say, Rob, is that they, you know, almost every myth and story and legend and parable and things um, touches upon 
the idea of hand to hand combat and swords and these items that are handed down from from you know father to son and i think i mean i'd like your thoughts on this in a moment but i think maybe it's something to do with the sword being being an extension of the man rather than being kind of its own uh, mechanism so you, you're when you're when you're fighting with a sword you are you are the mechanism you plus the sword are the mechanism but when you're fighting with a gun the gun itself is the mechanism so it kind of it bridges what man creates with man himself which is that's that's exactly it it's it's to do with that intimate contact yeah. and it's also the the reality of consequence because to stand up against somebody with a sword it's, it's all very well looking at it in the movies and all that kind of stuff but it's gonna hurt if you get this wrong you've got to know what you're about mm. Uh, you've got to be very, very, very sure. And in that sense as well, you, you'd have to be inspired by either your love for your family and the people around you, your clan or whatever it is, um, to do your very best in this fight. Or, the, the, or it, was, it was not worth being inv in, involved in the fight in the first place. You know, you'd have to have strong belief mm. in something. Whereas with a gun, you don't have to believe in anything at all. It's a remote tool. It's like it's like being over in, in, in Virginia and sitting in a, in a little office there with a screen in front of you and bombing somebody in Afghanistan at, at a wedding. It's the it's that idea of it's, it's impersonal mm. and you don't have to bring anything of yourself to it. Whereas with the sword has, has always involved the, the individual um, and the, the will of the individual and, and all of their accumulated desires and fears i suppose yeah the, there's no such thing as a pot, a pot shot with a sword <laughs> there's no like you know s sniping someone from you know three miles away with a sword um and I, I i just finished reading the uh the bernard cornwell saxon chronicles um series of books and one of the things that i love about those books is how visceral the description is of i mean it's there, there are so there are too many battles to name that occur within that series of books and every single one has a very very visceral description of being up close in the shield wall and you know the the, the use of the sword and the dangers and the and the emotions that go with that and it feels to me like quite a, an authentic description of what it would feel like uh, you know something which we're you know we're probably never going to experience in in our you know current lifetime um i don't know if you're familiar with those books rob but they're they're really great for describing that yeah, yeah i i read i think it was the winter king by him mm. and also um about the one about agincourt uh, right yeah yeah no, i enjoyed that kind of like yeah. lucid des descriptions of stuff is great yeah really when, good. when i was a kid that's that's kind of what got me into this kind of stuff is that a love for history i wasn't i wasn't very good academically but one of the things I really enjoyed was history lessons. Yeah, uh, and uh, but that's before they started teaching us about the, um, uh, you know, the, the the corn repeal laws and all that kind of nonsense in the Victorian period, and it was more like Vikings, Saxons. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in terms of spiritual views, um, I know that um, Rob and I have a shared um, interest in um, an author and a Gnostic thinker called John Lamb Lash. Um, Rob has um, more of a, an insight into Gnosticism than I do, um, and we were just talking about it briefly before um, before we came on live here. But um, John Lamb Lash is someone who I was introduced to first on uh, Red Ice Radio, um, which is uh, I think Rob and I have both been listeners for many years um, it, back since the time when Red Ice was purely about you know so-called conspiracy theories. Um, but um, the, the shows, the early shows that they did with John John Lash were, for me, incredibly eye-opening. Um, this this whole idea of um, of a of a, a sacred earth that he calls Gaia Sophia, um, and this these kind of interlopers, this this demiurgic and archontic interlopers who have um, tried to impose something artificial upon this um, this beautiful realm. Um, and uh, is would would I be right in thinking, Rob, that that was your introduction to that John Lash was your introduction to Gnosticism, or were you already quite um, familiar with the concept before coming across John Lash's work? No, John's stuff um, was not not the first time that I'd been reading about Gnosticism, mm -hmm. but it was a, a very interesting interpretation, and that's why a lot of them. Um, uh, academics that are involved with that 
wouldn't necessarily uh, share the same views that he does and his his particular interpretation. Mm. But however, as he quite rightly points out, most of the academe that have been involved with research on the um, on on the the not just the Dead Sea Scrolls but also the uh, the Nag Hammadi um, texts have been. Um, uh, involved at one level or another with with, with the Catholic Church mm. or similar kind of like religious establishments, so they go in and on behalf of religion. They try to piece together the narrative um, using that as the as the as the premise that that what they're looking at is basically another kind of subsect of Christianity. Where whereas John Lash quite rightly says that this was around thousands of years before. Uh, the Judeo-Christian tradition came along, and in fact, was one of the things was 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 the great um, system that was almost completely eradicated uh, once religion began to get its hold, um, and has been um, has been enemy number one since since uh, that that time, really. So. He has a unique view on it. As we talked um, at one stage before about the general consensus about Gnosticism seems to have been that the world is an evil place and that the, the, the God um, the God Yahweh or Yaldabaoth um, is the, the, the evil demiurge and he's, he reigns over this and, you know, in, in, in encapsulating man within a prison planet, whereas uh, John Lash doesn't see it that way, that way whatsoever. He reinterprets the the, the mythical cycle of of the Aeon of uh, Sophia and her her descent from the um, from from the Pleroma uh, in a much more scientific way, and and postulating this idea that um, currents of plasma from the centre of the of the of the cosmos are they were given um, if, if you like godlike attributes of these Aeon type attributes. One of them being the to fire, um, which under a current of will uh, constellates in this arm of the universe and forms into into uh, the body of a planet. Um, so, you know, recent kind of ecological theories about the, the planet being planet Gaia is this return to a more um, a more Hellenic sort of description and what, what, how they would understand in the Greek world how the, the, the world itself was a living organism and it had consciousness. John Lash posits this idea that um, Sophia herself, once she decided to to push her energy into this corner of the universe, um, became a physical planet and all, all of all of all of, in one way became asleep, so is dormant, um, but is gradually beginning to come back to self consciousness and awareness. But however, one of the the, the most um, the most difficult part of the story is that because she didn't have the full consent of her uh, binary partner, so it's like a male and a female element, almost like you're a positive and a negative charge within a um, with, with with an electrical circuit. You need both of those to be able to make something which is which is wholly in one direction. So because she didn't have that that other charge, and I'll try not to waffle on too long about this, no, um, do. didn't have the permission to do this thing. There was a side effect, and the side effect was the the birth of a kind of like bastard offspring who's not actually uh not actually self-aware to the stage that it can look at itself but it thinks of itself as being the creator of this earth and it's almost like the son of 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 the of an unlawful act but it's not um it's not so much of a physical being it's, it's like a um it's a, a metaphysical parasite a parasitical force the archontic energies which have tried to find a way of manifesting on this on a beautiful planet uh, in order to be able to experience what it is to be alive and to have all these uh, all these these human experiences at least the potential uh, potential of human experience which can be really great but it seems like everything's been stacked against us and purposely so um, to to dumb us down and to numb us to the stage where we don't interact with the universe the cosmos and our, our particular um, earth in the way that we should do naturally so we've been cursed in that way but john lamlash as i get say coming back to him he posits the idea that the the original judeo-christian religion the abrahamic the roots of the Re Re abrahamic religions were infested by this parasite because they opened themselves up spiritually to the idea about worship of whatever was available the, at the, time the redeemer complex yeah 
Yeah. Demon complex. Mm. And this is this is my whole um, thing I'm putting across through messengers of deception. It's like every time that anybody's tried to um, tried to summon up the the angels and the archangels and this and that, whatever they like to call them, there's always this mischievous and uh, sometimes very very dangerous and in this case disastrous consequence which is um uh which is, is, is deception absolute deception mm. and being used so we the, the the modern day in the modern day we tend to think about it as aliens you know or the aliens they're they're from outer space or whatever well it's not it's exactly the same thing it's the same phenomena which is which has reoccurred throughout the ages and you know, they call it the little folk or the fairies or they call it the spirits or the whatever mumbo jumbo from all, all over the planet it's exactly the same thing which people are interpreting in different ways the jinn if you like in in the the, the arabic world um and it it always seems to draw people in through this uh hypnotic quality of of having power and other worldly goods and great um, great wisdom and knowledge and all the rest of it but it's an envious energy which is trying to find a way to manifest in this planet the only way it can manifest is parasitically through the human experience and actually latching on to people and using them as the vehicle to be able to serve its own ends so that's where you get this sort of corrupted idea about the demiurge being and um, the 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 root of all all evil in this planet and stuff like that it's not that you've got a choice whether you let this stuff in your system and let it run you or you don't you know that's that's what it comes down to so mm. a lot of people um, defer to the religious structure and they say well that's fine you know i buy into all of this stuff and if i repeat this mantra um you basically hook yourself up to that mainframe and you become just a useless idiot or rather a useful idiot that was fascinating thank you for that i mean i, I th so some of those listening will know that i um i consider myself a heathen and have done for for many years um one of the things which um which rob mentioned there actually is is this john lash's um interpretation of gnosticism which is that actually essentially pagan and gnostic are interchangeable uh uh well pre pre judeo-christian worldviews and that the gnostics were those who um preserved those the the the, the wisdom and, and mystery tradition of the pagan uh uh you know traditions which had existed for thousands of years prior to the the arrival of of the abrahamic religions so this is something which resonated with me strongly because um prior to that i'd only heard of gnosticism as kind of an offshoot of christianity you know you hear people talk about gnostic christianity um but what rob has just described um and what john lash describes in his book uh, not in his image is that Gnosticism was the the kind of the default, which uh, you know interchangeable with the pagan worldview, and the pagan worldview, um, and th th there's there's a lot of debate that happens around uh, that, that that goes on around this is this idea of is the material world um, something to be beloved and to aspire to and to cherish, or is it something to transcend? Um, often. In, I mean, to all intents and purposes, in the Christian faith, it's something to transcend. It's something. It's it's like a stop stopgap before reaching, you know, the the heavenly kingdom. Um, mm. Whereas from from the heathen worldview, it's or the pagan worldview. This natural realm is itself sacred and wonderful in 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 every sense, which is much more similar to John Lash's uh, view of Gnosticism. Yeah, I would I would agree with you on that. I'd say that the the two things are interchangeable, and um, there's there's always this tendency with the religious structure to try and own everything. So they have to to grab hold of the idea about Gnosticism, and they have to they have to filter it through their own lens and say, oh, it's, it it belongs to this because there's only one true way, and all the rest of it. It it supersedes. Mm. Um, all of this stuff. It's uh, I mean, it's even an unfortunate name to call it because. Um, it was almost like a um it's it was a uh, derogatory term gnostic mm. it was it was it was the ancient way of saying smart ass it's like somebody that thinks they know it all they the 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 um christian fathers would call them gnostics to be able to ridicule them um whereas they 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 refer to them themselves um with a with a different with a different 
different kinds of names, names like the Telestai and things like that. So, you know, people, people that were um, aimed, that they had a particular aim that, and they understood. And they, they were able to observe the, the natural world and they were able to observe, observe the stars and the, the planets and understand that there was a purpose to this. Whereas, as you quite rightly point out, there's within the religious sphere, there's always this kind of like um, uh, d desire to turn your back on this awful, wretched world and, and get the hell out of it. It's almost as though somebody's, um, uh, somebody's scuppered the religious view and, and poisoned the well for these people who, who can't get out of the... Of the um, of the experience of life quickly enough, so, so, and maybe that's it's almost yes, it's almost sorry. like um, Gnosticism only has re relevance in a post Judeo Christian world. So, prior to the arrival of the Abrahamic religions, um, Gnosticism would be I mean, it, it wouldn't have been a label, and even if it was, it wouldn't have been a relevant label because people just lived the way that they, they lived in harmony um, with with this with this earth, which. Um, the Gnostics later came to identify as Gaia Sophia. So it's only really in a post-Abrahamic um, world where Gnosticism is relevant because what Gnosticism does is takes the pagan worldview and puts uh, brings in the context that comes from the, the Abrahamic religions and explains why that arrived, why the Abrahamic religions arrived onto the scene. Um, so... You know, from from my personal point of view, you know, I've I've kind of toyed with the idea about r maybe even writing a book sometime um, on uh, on Gnostic heathenry because I, I believe that there are so many um, so many uh, uh, you know similarities and contrasts uh, you know uh, b contrasts between um, Gnosticism and paganism um, that put in the right context it make they, they make a lot of sense together um, but obviously paganism in its pure form doesn't understand a post abrahamic world whereas gnosticism does mm. yeah I, I suppose you could you could say that perhaps the gnostics had a um, a scientific perspective as well mm. so that you you'd have like the, the library of alexandria which was um, which was burnt burnt to the ground and a lot of knowledge that was that was lost from the pre-christian world back then yeah. intentionally it seems as well that there was there was a great deal of knowledge, there was a great deal of understanding. I suppose we romanticise it because it was probably a very difficult time too, but you can also imagine um, uh, the, uh, this time where people had a universal sort of language, which would be symbols as well as anything else, and an understanding perhaps even um, through the mathematical sort of medium, the Pythagoreans and all this kind of stuff, where they, they would be able to, to explain and understand ideas uh, universally. And... Uh, and understand one another's place within that scheme of things too so i wouldn't i wouldn't see that there's any difference between the the the, the pagan outlook or if you if you say the heathen outlook and and the gnostics is, as i say it's just a label that's put on to people mm. but perhaps there were parts of those societies which were intimately dedicated toward what's what are known as the mysteries and that's the more esoteric element yeah. rather than the 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 more um the more agricultural if you like end of the scale yeah the 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 kind of the, the rituals and routines that, that are so often associated with paganism where you have you know the majority of people who participate in them um they it, it very much feels at, at home to them it's part of their tradition and they don't question it for a moment but then there's a, a, a subsect among them who uh who are well versed in the in the symbols and the science that goes beyond that mm -hmm. yeah um yeah. i'm interested yeah. uh, you, you said um uh, a few minutes ago you were talking about the um the the you know what we call aliens now um, as being essentially the same, uh, 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 unless I've misunderstood you, as being the same thing as uh, as the archons or um, the the jinn. Um, I, in as a heathen, I have uh, identified, and, and others that I know um, and have studied from, uh, identify the the Jotun, the the giants, as the same thing. Um, this kind of um, anti anti nature force which um, upsets the the natural order, um, and which the you know you have the the you know gods like Thunor um, or some know him Thor who fights the the frost giants to uphold the 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 kind of sanctity of man's realm of of the of the natural realm. 
um, from these giants. And in in listening to and picking out some of your lyrics, um, and I was I was reading a review recently actually of, of Messengers of Deception, and the reviewer um, was talking about how you know he can't see anything controversial in this album. All that Rob's talking about is Gnosticism and aliens. Um, but I, I knew that you weren't literally talking about aliens in the in the kind of um in the sense that most people would talk about little gray aliens and ufos and things like that um is is there anything that you wanted to kind of expand upon with that and and why you decided to focus on some of that with your lyrics well i suppose that the 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 postscript song for um messengers of the section because i scrubbed the album of the songs that are written by other by other members of the band the previous band apart from the title track, which was written by John Misery, and it was a great track, and John and I are still good friends, so it was good to, to be able to hold on to that one. But I needed to be able to write a little bit more, so I wrote the song Babylonian Death Cult. And, the, the I mean, it's the funniest thing, because I've actually been expecting people to blow up over that one, because, I mean, it's, it's as though they don't understand what I'm talking about about at all you know it's it's a it's a it's a it's a very pointed and very um uh, uh, and very rich song if you if you approach it from a certain angle uh, and i'm uh, yeah well you, you'll get that anyway but yeah my my i suppose my interest in uh, in ufos and that kind of stuff i i i never really got into it at all back in the 90s and you know when when a lot of the the first internet was was actually spouting a lot of this sort of a ufo um conspiracy theory stuff and all the rest of it and area 51 and things i couldn't really get a hang on it at all because it seemed to me that there's something a little bit out of place about that and it wasn't really until i started to to hook into a completely different stream of literature which was jacques valet um and uh, and john keel and these these guys between them take the narrative in a completely different direction and one that all of a sudden I could understand and go that's that's why I felt something was amiss here because it's almost like a, a psyop mm. which is to, to divert people from something that's always been going on and interacting with us and trying to make it into a modern day phenomena which is somehow you know allied with the whole Hollywood mainstream uh, narrative and outlook mm. and become in a sense a sort of like new space age space age religious model but this the the knowledge that it was a recurring motif and theme and it was a recurring um uh pantheon that has been here for thousands of years they're just they just tend to acclimatize or they they represent themselves in the garb of the day or slightly beyond the ken of the garb of the day so it's like can be slightly more sophisticated technolo technologically than the current um a state of play so that's why you get this um the the these ridiculous looking sort of flying saucers with little aerial sticking out in the 40s and 50s because it's almost that was the super um uh the, the super um uh idea of the the ultimate sort of like weirdness and how it, ooh, we imagine if there's a shining metal saucer it could be made out of aluminum and it might have like aerials on top so people were seeing this stuff so the the phenomena manifests in tandem with the people that um that perceive mm -hmm. it so it's to do with, it's to do with a manipulation of your senses yourself and getting you to believe something or rather covering what the true phenomena is by an image which is um projected onto your consciousness there's a, there's through a, the experience there's itself. a cultural lens basically isn't there cultural lens but it also seems to be um uh seems to be set off by things yeah sequences of of, of lights hmm. um there's there's like almost like a, a, a hypnotic thing that that, that that's occurs first of all before a lot of these big experiences hmm. and people only realize that afterwards but they've been taken into another space altogether. Mm -hmm. That's why you get missing time because it's almost like going in, into a dream space and not really being within the world anymore, but be temporarily outside of that, experiencing something which seems very, very nuts and bolts real, yeah. but is a manipulation, is a simulation in a way. Yeah, my, my introduction to this whole concept was um, w many years ago, I read uh, the book Supernatural by Graham Hancock. Um, which basically um, explores the whole idea of shaman, shamanistic um, um, visions and, and the, the, the spirit world that the, the shamans of, of indigenous cultures would, um, would, would 
encounter in their journeys um whether through the use of ritual dance or um you, you know um entheogenic drugs things like that but one of the things that he points out in that book and it was the first time that i'd ever considered this um is that lots of the descriptions of these otherworldly spirits by these shamans are uncannily similar to the description of the the gray big-eyed aliens um that was actually probably come to think of it actually that was probably the catalyst towards me becoming um uh, to me going down a more spiritual path myself this this you know i'd never been introduced to this idea of a of a spirit world which is you know um is in tandem or parallel with with the kind of material realm that we experience most of the time um so i started looking into that and bought a couple of books on celtic shamanism um things and this is i mean this is going back probably um that's probably a good sort of 15 to 20 years that I first started looking into this kind of stuff. Um, and then when I uh, combined that with a, um, an understanding of my, uh, of my ethnic and ancestral identity, then that's what led me to um, this, this, this uh, understanding of, of the runes and of Woden and Thunor and of the, of the, the old English gods um, and understanding that there was a shamanic tradition within um, the the old English ways as well, which I was introduced to via the book The Way of Weird by uh, Brian Bates, which really brings that whole idea to life. But um, yeah, and no, I was um, it's good to hear that um, y you know you're when you're talking or when people think you're talking about aliens in your lyrics, this is this is actually what you're referring to, um, because it's a much yeah. less superficial, it's a much more um, um, insightful understanding of the whole phenomenon of what people you know assume to be aliens actually these otherworldly beings which we come into contact with via some kind of um, momentary initiation or as you say you know experiencing lights or um, some kind of um, um, uh, you know altered state of consciousness yeah, yeah I mean this, this is um you, you saying again with this the idea about the um, the archetypal grey alien, which, which, yeah, you're quite right. The, the, it's, it's an image that goes throughout all different cultures, all different times in history. But one of the ones that really stuck with me and that resonates most recently is um, Alistair Crowley's uh, lamb vision, which was basically when he was um, he was in the period where he's been dictated this this book called the Book of the Law by uh, a, a so-called spiritual being called Ivos, and he was he he was um, sketching out this being that um, that, he, that he saw in in one of his trances uh, and it's got this big head and big big eyes and all that kind of stuff and you look at it today and you go well that's that's pretty much the archetypal sort of gray being mm. um it seems to be that's yeah that, that that's it's something that pops in and out of the timeline all, all the way along you just need to recognize that every diff every culture has different names for these creatures and entities and and again they're pantheon it's all because they do it's almost pantheon. like the the kind of um the the prevailing um kind of dominant mainstream popular culture at every step of the way throughout history is engaged in throwing us off the scent in some form or another mm. and in more recent times it's through this whole kind of x-files you know little gray aliens ufo abductions thing um when actually the truth yeah. has always been the same thing it's always been that there is this um there is this other spirit world which we have the ability to come into contact with if, if we understand that it's there and we know how to do it and we approach it in the right way but it's almost like we're being thrown off the scent the whole time and again this comes back to gnosticism um because this is this this has its roots in the abrahamic religion which ultimately the gnostics would say was trying to throw people off the scent of their their true identity the relationship with the earth and with with gaia sophia with the goddess yeah yeah i'd agree with that absolutely this uh it's, it's like a great psyop with the with relation to like you say this guy writing a comment saying it's just about ancient aliens it's not, it's not about ancient aliens mate but the 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 whole thing is being is being um managed basically that it's being managed as a project so you you get like contemporary and media and film and and literature and all that kind of stuff pushed toward uh pushed toward fantasizing about this and making it uh um making it slightly ridiculous um otherworldly of course so it's not it's not it's nothing that you can um that that comes from this sphere whereas valet and, and keel saying rather than an extraterrestrial phenomenon it's an ultra terrestrial phenomenon so it's something that's always been here and has always interacted with us in one way or another mm. um 
Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um. So with the with the kind of you know the, the, as we touched on earlier this idea of the, you know there's this one kind of popular and i think you and i would agree incorrect interpretation of gnosticism where this material realm is itself and uh, this kind of illusory pri- prison and that our real existence is actually actually beyond this um now i was talking to um and i know that he's listening is a, a good friend of mine called phil um who i believe you've had contact with is phil from mimmer's brunner um, which is an excellent channel if no one's mm-hmm. if uh, if anyone's not familiar with that yet. But uh, Phil and I have had conversations uh, recently about this idea with with everything that's going on now, and and hopefully this will segue into the next point of discussion. Everything that's going on now with this this whole COVID scam seems to be about almost trying to to teach people to believe in a reality which, to those of us who who see through it is completely absurd so it's almost like this this veil is being is being drawn down over the eyes of the majority but not the minority and uh, phil and i discussed that this this could this could be the real um crux of this of this kind of gnostic idea of an illusory world is not that the natural world is inherently prison like but that through the actions of these kind of um, it, it, this, these insidious forces, which you know perhaps uh, could be called the archons or the demiurge or whatever, um, through the actions of them in more modern times, they've turned. They're, they're managing to turn for a large number of people this wonderful natural realm into this uh, prison-like illusory world. And over the last year, we've seen that veil coming down um, over the eyes of people. I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, Rob. Yes, I do. Um, at the moment, we're in an age of the biophobe. Um, we're being taught to uh, hate nature and hate life. Um, and uh, we're going through a ritual whereby we're being separated from all of these things, from us, from individual people, from our families, from our loved ones. We're being separated from nature, locked up, locked away. We're not supposed to breathe. Um, we're, we're not supposed to interact in any way as human beings whatsoever. It's a it's a hateful, pernicious, um, downward spiral that we're being invited into. Yeah. Part of the reason that um, it's being constructed is because it's a silicon world um, and it's not a carbon world that, that they're making. And the silicon world appeals directly to the archontic mind because it's something it can interact with much easier than it can directly with the physical world. Right. So if you like, the evil can come through the mainframe. Um, it's much more at home within the um, within the computer-generated um, imagery world because of its own illusory nature, but its its ability to be able to manipulate things, data, numbers, um, and uh, the 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 view, the semblance of reality itself. That's the way that I feel about it. As for the right. the great con that's going on just now, I think that it's no understatement to say that we are at war at the moment mm-hmm. and we're most people are completely asleep to that they're completely unaware that there's a war going on and the war is being waged by people that are manipulated by this parasitical mind virus and have been for generations and their um, eventual goal is to eradicate humanity to a great degree but also to separate humanity from its experience of the natural world itself yeah. so everything that we've talked about in the nature of of the who we who we are and who we came from um is coming to a head right now because there is there is a spiritual war and spiritual is a bit too vague a term really i suppose but it's about it's very very real it's here and it's at our doorstep and you can you can feel every single day there's almost like a tension which is go- coming and going there's like one moment something's being said and then it's slightly withdrawn and then another proposition is being put across and you you know exactly what they want to do mm-hmm. and, and the next steps that they're going to be um, rolling out. And they have to do this because this is their only chance now because they played they, the whole 
deck of cards is out now for anybody that's got the eyes to see it it's there in front of us and you can say i see it i've seen it for the last year or so mm. and i've tried to talk to people about it and they look at you as though you're some kind of lunatic and the things i said a year ago and nobody needed to be a prophet you just you extrapolate from the available information if you were somebody that didn't particularly like people or humanity in general what would you do with this situation you do exactly what they're doing just now yeah. which is to continue yeah. the pressure and, and also to psych and not psychologically manipulate um the the human race in this country it's probably worse than anywhere else because we've got a they're doing it every single day. You have a government announcement saying we're not going to have health passports. Definitely you're not going to do this. The next day is like, well, when we do have health passports, mm -hmm. and then they'll go back to, well, we're just thinking about it. We're not thinking about it. We're going to inject your kids. We're not going to inject your kids. They're, they're, they're creating the breeding ground for madness yeah. within people. Uh, and um, in, in, in psychological terms, it's, um, I think it was Yuri Bezmenev, the, 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 the defecti defecting KGB agent in the 1970s, who gave a series of lectures about how you get a society to the point um, where it's completely helpless. And this is exactly the, 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 um, the method, methods they use in the Soviet Union to break down the willpower of people and to demoralize them. It's the most important thing is to demoralize people. And one of the greatest ways you can demoralize a person is by making them repeat information they know is untrue. Yeah. So if you say, N save the NHS, save lives, stay at home, wear a mask, and all these things when you're feeling within yourself, I don't know about this, I really don't know. But if you, when you find out, oh, it's, not the, it's not the truth, it's not the truth at all, but you've been, you've, you've been forced to regurgitate this, you, you have to go into a position of either reflecting upon that yourself or you you just give in mm. you just put your hands up and say well that's i'm, I'm completely demoralized i don't know what's up i don't know what's left and right anymore um i'm i'm ready to be taken over and we're near we're nearly at that stage I, now. Could, I, could, I couldn't agree more with everything you said there i came across a really interesting quote recently which i'd just like to read out now because it's very relevant to what you've just said um i'm not sure who this man is but um, it's a man called theodore uh, dalrymple and he wrote apparently in my study of communist societies, I came to the conclusion that the purpose of, purpose of communist propaganda was not to persuade or convince, not to inform, but to humiliate, and therefore, the less it corresponded to reality, the better. When people are forced to remain silent when they are being told the most obvious lies, or even worse, when they are forced to repeat the lies themselves, they lose once and for all their sense of probity. To assent to obvious lies is in some small way to become evil oneself. One's standing to resist anything is thus eroded and even destroyed. A society of emasculated liars is easy to control. And that's, that's exactly the point, succinctly put. Yeah, yeah that's, that's it. That's at the, at the nub of this at the moment. Um, it's it's to, to basically do that, to make us hate ourselves to make us hate our very nature within ourselves and, and to separate us from nature by saying that we are inherently evil. Because look, look at what we can do. Look at the bullshit that we'll put up with. Mm. Look at what we will do to one another. Look, look how we'll say, well, I don't really agree with it, but maybe kids should be injected, you know, with something which is an experimental um, gene therapy. It's, it's not a vaccine and which could have disastrous consequences for the human race. Maybe we should not be worried about um, uh, the risk of um, fertility. Uh, being being wiped off the face of the planet by a, a, a group of greedy individuals who, who seem to have their 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 particular hands in, in every single pie and every single piece of this jigsaw puzzle you find exactly the same people mm. and they're all bound at the bloody hip yeah. they're all the same kind of they're, they're, they're all the same archontic sort of hydra with these many different heads mm. all different all speaking different tongues in different countries but all basically united in this one scheme which is to to take away to take away the humanity from humans and to push push us into a world which is completely contrived yeah and which is absolutely yeah. controlled and which is a return to not just the feudal state of the of the medieval times but it's but it's before that it's 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 the state of absolute slave mm. and absolute master there's a and your I was, was going to say, there's a, there's a great line in my second favourite film of all time, Excalibur. Um, when a man lies, part of the world dies. And in, this, in, in what's going on now, 
we've all been taught to become very, very comfortable with lies, you know, because even most people who are going along with the, the regulations and lockdown measures and the, the muzzles and everything, deep down, most of them do realise that there's a lot of deception and lies going on, but they don't have the courage um, to to do anything about it, essentially. So we're living now in a society that's becoming rather and uh, you know terrifyingly comfortable with lies and it feels like that is destroying everything which was built up prior to it and that, that indeed is in, is the intention of it um all of this deception it's it's almost like i feel like the the architects of this want us to know that they're lying because that way we become comfortable with the lie we become comfortable with the idea that everything we knew is being being torn down whereas you know i i I can almost forgive someone who doesn't realize that there's lies um being being told right now um but anyone who does is it's it's an unforgivable position to be in um and that's why i feel i mean i i've welcomed this last year with open arms myself because it's finally been the kind of the 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 straw that broke the camel's back as you said earlier um to make me just come all out and say this is where I stand and this is where I intend to stand for um, for, for, for the rest of my life um, and I don't care what anyone thinks because what's going on now is far too important to not be um, to not be standing up to not be sticking your head above the parapet well that's the thing isn't it because so many people are invested in social media now and they've been taught that um, they've been spoon fed um, acceptance and um, and approval uh, and and they've been also taught the, the the central nature of division as well. So it's like they've they've created echo chambers for one another and their opinions, mm. um, and they're, they're judged by likes or dislikes, uh, approval or disapproval. So people have learned this behavioural behavioural therapy about don't say anything which gets a dislike um, in in life generally now. So they're very very careful about that. So they. They're, they're, they're guarded and they're really, I can only say they're really, really compromised. That's an excellent by point. This need, yeah. yeah, by this need for approval all the time, mm. um, because it's, that's all backed up in every, in every part of their lives. So there's a big tick box, there's a big thumbs up, yeah. or there's a th- or an angry face. So that's what happens when you go into the local co-op and you're not, because I don't, I don't wear a mask anymore. I, mm. I, I started out doing it. I thought well, in deference to people, because there might be something to this. I don't do it anymore. Mm. Get a few dirty looks from people. And, and from very, very occasionally it might be somebody else that doesn't. And it's not me trying to be difficult. It's me trying to remind people. It's like, mm. well, from my view, you look really weird, you lot, because something's gone on with you and you can't quite snap out of it. Mm. You're under a spell. You're actually under a proper magical spell. It's something yeah. that's been done It's to a you. spell. And it's very, very it's really important to, for us to remind it, for, for us, uh, the, the likes of us who don't wear masks, because I've not worn one once, um, it's very, very important for us to remind ourselves that we are the normal ones. Because, it, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. you can walk into a shop and you, when everyone else is wearing masks, you can feel like the odd one out. And it can be it can be uncomfortable, even for someone who's used to being a bit of a de- dissident and a rebel for, you know, most of mm-hmm. their lives. It can feel uncomfortable. But we need to remind ourselves we are the normal ones. We are the same ones. We are the ones who are acting as human beings are supposed to act and have acted since time immemorial. Yeah, and we're in the we're in the midst of what can only be described as a great deception. Yeah. And it's you know if, if I if, if I was from the Abrahamic religions, I'd recognise that. Mm. But uh, you know it is it is a great great deception. Yeah, um, which is going on and um, which has got one end. And as I say, it's totally invested now. Gloves are off. Um, they're just trying to find ways of not doing it too quickly so to, to upset or slightly knock people out of their nap because they're this they're they're still sleepwalking for the most part and they they're going through the ritual and they're not actually they're not actually, actually going to get out of it you know if you said to, to, to most people tomorrow um it's over it's gone they'd still be wearing their mask because they found they found the new religion and this is the new religion this is the yeah. This is the thing that gives them gives their lives value, mm-hmm. um, because we killed off everything else. We killed off all meaning um, through through the lies of of Hollywood and and the media, it's, and through them having manipulated and and, and set and, and put 
s sent reality back to us through a dark mirror yeah. and distorted and lied about, made into something that it's not. So again, we we've always realised it was wrong. And we've um, we've always lied to ourselves all the way along, watching these films and all the rest of it. And we said, well, you know, it's just a, it's just for fantasy. I'll lose myself in this for a while, but that's moulded our behaviour. Yeah. But we've because we've lost our our god or our gods or whatever you like to call it. We're we're wide open for new ones, and this is this is our new one right now. This is our the um this is our dogma and our ritual. Our ritual is put on the mask, is mm -hmm. clean the hands, you know, and then it's like accept the holy Eucharist, which of course is like oh, but it's coming, it's coming. Are you, you going to get the AstraZeneca's Eucharist, or which one are you having? Oh, I'm having the very best one available at the moment. Oh, you're so lucky. Let's talk about that on social media all the time, shall we? Which one did you have? Yeah, isn't it exciting? And you and I are the heretics, you know. Uh, and many, I'm sure, most of those listening, we're the we're the new heretics of this religion. And it, it, <laughs> oh, absolutely, that's that's yeah, it's meant to yeah, be. Yeah, and it, it it makes. I mean, you're just making me think now on on my feet. You, you know, I I've you know we've we've known for a long time that they've been trying to destroy religion. I mean, after building up the the Abrahamic culture of the last couple of thousand years, that for the last few decades they've been trying to destroy uh, any connection, any kind of even even a, a false connection with the divine that people had through Christianity. Um, and I just always assumed that atheism you know atheist materialism was itself the end goal but you're making me think now in what you just said that actually the whole purpose of that was to create a void which could then be filled by this new religion mm -hmm. and that what's happening yeah. now couldn't have happened with the effectiveness that it has without having first spent the last few decades uh severing us from the remnants of any kind of spirituality that that we did have as a, as a society yeah yeah yeah, quite, quite so. That's that's how I think about that at the moment. Mm. Yeah, and it's it's kind of like the, um, you know, you've got you've got all the the sort of um, is it uh, Saul Linsky or whatever rules for radicals, and you've got the, the the Frankfurt School and all these people who set out purposely to be able to uh, to to move into into all the institutions, undermine them, um, and, and destroy them from within, but model them into their own behavioural models too. So preparing the way for what's come about now. So mm. there's been um, decades of infiltration um and uh, of subversion throughout all, all of the major um all the major sort of stations of society the, and the media itself is completely overrun now it's completely compromised and it's effectively become the enemy of the people because it no longer represents in any way matter or form the interests of the individual it's, it's totally dedicated toward subterfuge and um and hiding the truth it's going out of its way to stop us from seeing what's real mm. so that's why we have the the coming back to our original thing it's the the, the, the birth of of cancel culture and its extension through all the social media into youtube and and the yeah you know, and all the other platforms they can possibly get their hands on it's all about controlling the narrative and there's a fight on almost for the souls you know if you if you're a religious person you say it's for the souls of of the people that haven't they, they haven't made up their, their mind yet because they haven't got a mind to make up. Mm. They're just walking through. They're just sleepwalking just now. Mm. Um, but they're still players, and they, there's still the potential for them to wake up. But it's almost like they've taken away all the means for us to be able to wake people up with. You know, we can have this conversation here, and I don't know how many many people we've got, got watching now, but I'm thankful for those people. About, about because there's, there's, you know, there's barely anybody else out there. Yeah. You know, I, I had um, I had a Facebook page up until very recently, and I, you know, I must have had, I don't know, lots and lots of people, you know, 1,000 plus or wherever it is, as friends there, most of who I've never met in my life. Mm -hmm. um, and I've met people subsequently through that and all that. That's all, that's all very great. But then I start posting things that I think, and it's all of a sudden that dwindles down to not many people want to talk about that too. So I ended up with, with three people where we were having a discussion. I was thinking, well, I'm, I'm, I'm in... I'm in front of a thousand people here yeah. um, trying to put out pearls which are being um, pushed aside and ignored. So what's the fucking point? Pardon my language. No, no problem. Why am I doing this? So, so um, with that in mind, what do you think we should be focusing on now and, and how do you think people like us should be kind of, what do you think we should be um, putting our efforts towards? Um, do, do you think that we should be expending much effort in waking up those who are not awake to this um or do you think um as i do that i think we're at the point now where almost all of the people who are going to get this 
have got it by now you know there are a few people on the fence and, and obviously we should do what we can to help them but i'm at a point now where i feel like we need to be looking towards preparing for a, a sad a sadly what is an inevitable um future what, what do you think how do you think we yeah. should be preparing what do you think we should be doing kind of moving forward the likes of us yeah i, I agree with you um that the times come now where there's the, the the wedge has been driven between people, mm. but that's going to get worse, yeah. and it's going to get worse when they when they create the, the narrative about the the clean and the unclean, which is really what's going to be pushed next, yeah. um, and they'll, they'll become a very but they, they, I mean they're trying to get as many people into the clean farm as possible, um, so that they have more leverage. Unfortunately, it's not working very well even in the UK. It's working even less well in places like France where they just can't get people motivated to to buy into this at all which is brilliant and i'm actually like you know i'm, I'm envious of the french for once in my life it's like well done you lot you, they, you, you cheese eating fucking <laughs> they 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 say yeah I've, I've got a lot of admiration well, for the I'm french nice. when it comes to dissidents they know how to rebel they know how to 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 kick up a stink and i i definitely admire that about them it's, it's good to, i wasn't aware yeah, that there, there's any kind of resistance there but it's good to hear um it's it's quite shameful i mean i well it's, 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 it's sorry go on rob so it's not it's not that it's resistance it's just that they, there's no pickup in their in their um uh, in their vaccine program right. they had four percent of people that were taking them over here we've got something ridiculous like i think it's about 56 percent it, it is or, it's I read crazy that today. I mean, it's, everybody's queuing up it's and in, it's in the 50s yeah it's shameful to be honest i'm 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 quite ashamed yeah. Yeah. um of how of how willingly the british people have walked into it um and it, yeah I, I don't really know what to say about that because um as most people listening know um you know i i'm proud of my country um and of my 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 ancestors as i'm sure as i'm sure you are rob um but it's it's really shameful yeah. what's what's happening now um yeah i don't really know what to say about that other than all we can do is just try to connect with and empower and support and encourage those of us who are still of like mind well, I, um, to, to come back to that point, I mean, I don't have any fixes for this, but I think that you, you pointed out um, some, some helpful ideas on, on one of your um, shows. Okay. Uh, and there's other people that say, you know, basically it's good to um, take care of your diet, exercise, positive, positive mental attitude, as, um, as Bad Brains would say, PMA. Mm -hmm. Is as much as you can get of that is good. Hanging out with with like-minded people, um, not getting too drawn into this whole downward spiral because that itself is like a magical spell. Yeah. And um, you know, I, I watch too many videos about it and I get too angry about it and I get too dark about the whole thing. But there's there's there are various ways. We're not going to escape this, but we need to act as if because that's part of the 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 spell itself. They're making us act as if there's something going yeah. on and as if there's a great pandemic when there's not and um, the seasonal flu. So we need, need to act as if none of this has been happening. Mm. And that's why, you know, there's no mask act, act as though you're just a normal human being having a normal life in, in as, in as big a way as you possibly can. Yeah. And all that is, is to come back to the original thing about being the heretic and the, and the, um, and, and the person that doesn't bend the knee is that's the, you have to set an example. And even if it's just to one or two people, you set the example and say, well, I'll, I'll live this way for as long as I possibly can. I don't know that we're going to survive. Um, it could get really, really bad, but it hasn't got there yet. Mm. So we're still at the beginning of it. We've got, we've got to be careful not to project too much darkness into our immediate future because that will that will dim our own magic. Uh, and as as living um, sentient beings with a with a mystical uh, spiritual capability, we need to be able to harness every little spark of that energy that we we can mm. and use it imaginatively, even if we can't use it figuratively and physically in the world. Use it imaginatively because you know it's what we have. It's what we are as human beings. We just need to be human. Yeah. Because the yeah. everything about this is about. It's a war against humanity. Yeah, I, I find, you know, I find a lot, a lot of solace in thinking back over. You know, my wife sometimes gets upset thinking because we have three daughters, and she sometimes gets upset thinking that they're not going to get to experience the, the same things that 
that she and I experienced, you know, going to music festivals around Europe and, um, uh, you know, flying to interesting places further in Europe or um, all of the concerts that we've been to, the tours that we've been on, um, all of those kind of experiences, just little things like going to the cinema maybe even. um, She gets upset thinking that they're not going to experience these things. But I try to remind her, you know, firstly, this, 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 you and I need to be grateful that we did experience those things and we need to view the lives that we've had so far as being quite fulfilled so that anything that occurs from now on is, is a, both a bonus and in service to the next generation. And secondly, our children are going to experience incredible things in their life, just very, very different things. And you know in some ways we need to to embrace that on their behalf they they're going to have a uh, probably a more meaningful life than our generation had and i think we need to embrace that with open arms i mean really for, especially for spiritual people like like us death isn't something to be feared there are worse things than death and um i i believe it's um the the irish activist dolores carhill um oh no it's um What's her name? Catherine Fitz uh, Austin, I think she's called American. She's she's said that several times. There are worse things than death, and when you're a spiritual person, the idea of submitting to this demonic, um, these demonic demands of of ma- mask wearing and and forcible vaccines and things, to me, that's a fate worse than death. So I embrace the opportunity to resist those things, even if it means that perhaps there are. Um, in most people's eyes, worse things to come. Um, you know, we, we've got very interesting times ahead of us, and I think we need to really, really embrace that. And I think that will um, that will bring joy. It, it, it will bring its own kind of joy. This this new sense of meaning and purpose that we have. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. That's that. These are really good words. That's that's very wise. I know I'm actually drawn to towards some things that I heard you say before in one of your um, broadcasts. And this, the, the, it was quite insightful saying that the people that you would have thought were going to be up there at the barricades mm. um, and resisting this, they're, they're not there. Mm. All the people that I grew up with that were the, you know, they were they were the so-called rebels and the, you know, and the anti-system, anti-society. They're the people screeching like, um, like like zombies. You know, wear your mask, yeah. take your jab, all the rest of it. They they've actually they were the first people to buy into the insanity. Yeah and to spread it amongst everybody else and they're so they're so lame yeah they're so pathetic oh, thank, thank you for, thank um, you for mentioning that i was i wanted to bring that up in this in this chat actually and that kind of brings us full circle as well it's uh, and you know i think you you're probably even better positioned to to observe this than i am you know having been in you know having moved in kind of these um these rebellious punk and metal circles for for 40 years or so um is how you know all of the people that all the people that I grew up with who were in punk bands in their teens and who still listen to that music and still think that they are against the grain and they hate the Tories and um, Boris Johnson's a liar and um, you know they would be uh, fighting the the Empire in Star Wars and they would be fighting the uh, the, the 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 popular conception of the Nazis in World War Two and you know all these kind of things they are the freedom fighters yet when actual you know verifiable tyranny arrives on their laps mm-hmm. all they can do is stand with it and it it just it yeah. blows my mind that's, that's that was it that's that's what i picked up from from you there it's that this idea because one one of one of the people that i did know from my last experience is very much in the star wars and this kind of fantasy about you know having having been against the the the, the death star or whatever and you and they are they're the troopers in the death star yeah. you know in their own little movie yeah. now um it's just there's no resistance whatsoever yeah. they were they were the first to 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 just flop over and give in because they they they've they've made the whole thing palatable yeah. uh, um because they they're again the people that feed off uh off the um off the approval of others yeah and you know i don't really need that um, it's kind of nice when you get a pat on the back and somebody says, "Oh, good work, mate! You know, good album or whatever," and you go, "Great!" But I don't fucking live for that. No, you know, I'll just go and do what I do anyway. And I, when I started out on this particular venture, I I put out that couple of very very unfortunate press statements, which I would still stand by. Too right. But it got me into all the trouble. And I said, "Well, 
um, you know, at the end of the day, I'm going to I'm going to do this journey, and I'm going to make this make this album reappear, even if it's going to be on a cassette and put three men and a dog buy it. And I stand by that because it's not about approval from others; it's about approval from yourself. Mm-hmm. It's because if you don't do the things and be true to yourself, what kind of man are you? You know, yeah. what kind of what kind of life are you going to lead? What's your point in being here? What what what's your what what are you about? Well, who who are you? What are you doing here? You're wasting time. Yeah. You're wasting your breath. You're wasting. You're wasting food. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. It's, uh, for people like us, there, there's no choice but to stand against this. We don't. We don't have the the option of falling in line because it would go against everything that that propels us and everything that that, that gives us any any sense of, of meaning and identity in this life. Um, so yeah, I think um, unless you've got anything else you'd like to add, I think that's a, that's a great point to stop. We've we've covered all the points that I wanted to cover with you. Uh, we've been going for about an hour and forty minutes now, um, and as much as I'm sure we could we could continue for another hour and forty minutes uh, easily, um, I don't think there's any point in in going going much uh, much longer. People get a bit tired of of streams when they're too long. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, really appreciate you um, you having this chat with me, Rob, and. Um, yeah, I hope people out there enjoyed it. And yeah, is there anything else you you wanted to add at the end there, Rob? Yeah, I'll see all of you in the gulag. <laughs> yeah, I love. That. Have you have you seen that meme? I I don't really follow football. There's some football manager walking into the the dressing room, like doing a silly dance, and and all his uh, all his players are cheering him, and it says me me me, you know, walking into the into the FEMA camp after uh, after the roundup or something like that, and. You know, (laughs) things like that, you know, I mean, it's, it's funny on one hand, but at the same time, it's like, well, yeah, we need to remember we're we're not alone. We really aren't. There are, there are not just thousands. There are hundreds of thousands of people out there that think like us. And yes, those numbers will whittle down. People will, they will fold. They will succumb to the the lures of, of holidays and, and vaccine passports and gigs and festivals and things. And people will drop out, but there will we will still have a strong, albeit minority, core of people who are as passionate about standing against this as, as we are. And um, I just really look forward to, to building bonds with those people. You know, and also the other thing is that because... The information that we get, all the information we get, is from the enemy. We don't, we don't know how many we are. Yeah. You know, the, the only way I can judge it is I start to read comments in in, in interesting videos, and you suddenly realise there's a lot more people than there were this time last year. I've got to say yeah. that. You know, so there's hope. There's hope. We, you know, we we might not prevent what's coming, but we'll give it a damn good go, however we can. You know, I don't think you know, I don't consider myself a brave person in any way whatsoever. It's not that. It's just there's an imperative. You just have to say no. Um, and hopefully, uh, you know, hopefully we, we get to live. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, Rob. And, and thank you everyone for listening. I hope you've, uh, and, uh, I just want to say hi to my friend, uh, uh, eat, bake, sing in the chat there. She's a good friend of mine and, and, uh, has left some, some good comments along the way. Um, but yeah, thank you all for, for your comments and your, uh, and your attention to this. And, uh, after this, this stream finishes, I'm going to, um, get the recorded video up on, uh, Odyssey and YouTube for people to watch again after the fact, uh, you know, as long as there's no objection from Rob to that. Um, and, uh, yeah, thank you all for listening and, um, yeah, hopefully I can make some more videos soon cause I've been a bit, um, a bit busy with other things lately, which, um, which I can't really, uh, I can't really share too much of now, but there'll be an announcement, which is kind of relevant. So, but anyway, thank you for, for watching and, uh, we'll see you all soon. And, uh, yeah. Anything else to have Rob? No, thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for having us on board and, um, kudos to you, mate, you know, um, for, for something that you started off fairly recently, you, you really got, uh, you got your best foot forward and all, all strength to you. Thanks mate. Appreciate that. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thanks.